Good morning. Kind of loud. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. Uh, crowd's getting a little bigger, easing into it here. And all those that are home, we welcome you just as much being with us this morning. I um, have a few announcements. I uh, have quite a few announcements for our sick before we have our prayer. Um, uh, we need to remember Aaron Walker, as most of y'all know, he lost his mother this week uh, from a battle with cancer. And so uh, really, really hard on Aaron and his dad, I know. So remember them in their prayer, in your prayers, if you would. His fun her funeral, Mary, funeral will be uh, Tuesday at 2 o'clock at the Allen Free Will Baptist Church in Willica. Um, Sherry, Allen's uh, granddaughter, uh, Tina, you all probably know too, she had an accidental uh, gunshot and she's in the hospital and in a a lot of pain. It broke her femur. Uh, and so uh, we need to remember her uh, and Sherry. Make sure I'm not missing. Uh, Jackie's husband, Jimmy, has been in the hospital with his diabetes and he's home now, right? Um, Charlotte Johnson asked to, that we remember her. She is stage four lung cancer, and that's Clara Lee. Y'all remember Clara Lee Evington's daughter. And she comes here sometimes. I, I remember her coming, so please remember Charlotte. Um, <clears throat> need to remember Catherine Herring and Jim. I was talking to Jim and that, that cancer who, I'll tell you, it touches every family somewhere. And uh, Catherine's been a real battler and a fighter, and we need to remember her. She's having a lot of pain because it's on her, in her bone neck there, and it really hurts. So please remember them in your prayers. Uh, Danny Rose, uh, his is in remission, and he's looking for a bone marrow match. So let's remember Danny, y'all that know him. And um, anyone else that I might have missed? You know, you know who they are when we pray. Uh, I think it's important that to me in my prayer life, if you, you need to say a name, you know, God knows them all already. So you think, well, why don't we just say, get sick well. That's kind of not how God used his examples. He wants us to pray and uh, it's good for us to think of those people, and God likes us to offer those names up. So as we pray this morning, if you'll do that. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this beautiful Lord's Day. Lord, we'd ask you to be with all of us here and all of those watching at home. We'd ask you to be with all those that we just mentioned, Lord, ask you to put your hand of comfort on them. Lord, we're just grateful as Christians that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how, that no one else on this earth can help us, that we know that you look down upon us and that you love us and that your mercy is always with us, and that we're your children. Well, we always got to remember, Lord, we, we, want, we want us to be happy and healthy and live on this earth a long time, and you know that. But you gave us the Bible to tell us about a home that's not here, And if life was perfect here, Lord, maybe we wouldn't search for that afterlife home that you've promised us. 
Lord, we ask you to be with those that are sick. Please be with those that have lost their loved ones. Be with this congregation, Lord, that when this virus is under control, that we will all be back together. Be with us, Lord, that none of us lose our faith. None of us lose our zeal to come and worship. We pray for each and every one of ourselves in that. Lord, we'd ask that in our everyday life and that we would always make you happy with our life and make you proud of what we try to do on this earth. Lord, please be with us. Be with our country, our town, and our church, and that we will please you. These are our prayer this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We'll start out with, we will glorify. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who lives. He is Lord of all the universe. All praise to Him we give. So hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Next song is I Come to the Garden. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known all right our next song my Jesus, I love thee. After the singing of this song, we will have our Lord's Supper. Lord's Supper after the singing of this song.
My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the folly of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary. I love thee for wearing the crown of on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. We have come to the point in our service where we honor the one who gave his life for us on the cross at Calvary and done it willfully. And now let us willfully honor that service by following his command to take of the unleavened bread, which represents his broken body, and the fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this day. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We take this time, Father, to remember, not only by command, but by our willful resolution to come to you and honor that which has been given to us freely, a bitter sacrifice given in a terrible fashion, but has meant so much to each of us. Father, we ask that you bless this unleavened bread and the takers of it, that we do this in a manner well-pleasing to you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, Father, once again we come before your throne. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon this fruit of the vine, which fills this cup, that represents your said blood, given on the cross at Calvary for our sins. Willfully. Oftentimes we think that it was unwillful because the question was asked if the cup could be taken. But, Father, we know that it was your will that was being done. And by that sacrifice, each of us have a home in heaven, those who believe and obey. So Father, we ask that you bless this, the content of this cup, this fruit of the vine, as it represents that shed blood. And we ask that each that take of it this day are blessed and that are willing to do this in a manner well-pleasing to you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
I am I no more. I've been bought with blood. I am I no more. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And he rules my life. Jesus is my Lord, He will come again, He will come again, and He'll take me home, He will come again, I am mine no more, I am mine no more. I've been bought with blood. I am mine no more. Next song is I Love My Savior Too. After this song, we'll have our next prayer. Jesus, my heavenly King, love me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, onward I go. Closely to Him I cling, blessings still flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior, He loves me too. I seek His favor in everything I do. Walking with Him each day, love life does shine. Doing His will always, never repine. Kneeling to Him I pray, Thy will but mine. I love my Savior too. And I love my Savior, He loves me too. And I seek His favor in everything I do. Good morning. Glad to see all you guys here. It's great to see some familiar faces again. It's also great that this uh, TV show that they put on, I'm getting a little spoiled by that. Uh, get to watch you guys on my big screen TV, and <laughs> it's pretty neat. All righty, let's uh, bow. Let's have our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come to you this morning with humble, loving hearts. Father, we can't thank you enough for all that you've done for us, all the blessings that you bestow on us, the greatest one being your son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed it all for us, Father, in your great plan. Father, uh, we come to you to thank you for all these blessings. We thank you for uh, watching over this congregation. We do know we've had several that have become ill that are not here this morning. We also know that a lot of people have come down with this virus, but through our prayers, you heard us, and you brought them through. And we appreciate you hearing us, Father, and taking care of them. We ask you now, for the others that are sick and ill right now, very, a lot of them are uh, very ill, and Father, we are asking you to heal them, to bring them through, to make them whole again so that they may return to us and carry out your will. And Father, uh, we also, there's a few that's not here anymore. And uh, we know, Father, that w that was your will being carried out. We all have our day that we will return to you. 
but we also know that there's loved ones here that are hurting, Father. And you are a great comforter, and we ask you to comfort them every day. And Father, we ask you to continue to watch over this congregation and bless each and every one. We ask a special blessing for our preacher, Brother Rex, to continue to inspire him in your word that he can lead us every, every time we come here. We ask you to be with our church elders, Gary Lovell, Brenda Jensen, and Jeff McFerrin. We ask you to continue to bless them and their families as they serve you, Father. We ask you to continue to guide them and give them wisdom to guide this church according to your will and that's pleasing to you. Father, we ask you to be with those shut-ins and our widows and those in nursing homes. We ask you to give them strength. And if they're ill, we ask you to uh, ease their aches and pains. We also ask you to send their loved ones to them and send Christians to them, Father, so they do not feel abandoned or alone and that all their needs can be met. All these things we pray, Father, in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, a song before the lesson here. It's going to pop up. Six ninety nine in the book if you want to start turning. Six ninety nine. We're going to sing the first and third verse. First and third verse. Six ninety nine. They tried my Lord and Master with no one to defend within the halls of Pilate. He stood without a friend. I'll be a friend to Jesus. My life for him I'll spend. I'll be a friend to Jesus until my years shall end. The world may turn against him i love him to the end and while on earth i'm living the lord will have a friend i'll be a friend to jesus my love for him I'll spend, I'll be a friend to Jesus until my years shall end. To all who need a Savior, my friend, I recommend because He brought salvation is why I am his friend i'll be a friend to jesus my life for him i'll spend i'll be a friend to jesus until my years shall end amen brother rex Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the church says, Ah, oh, sounds so good to hear that. You just have no idea. Me and my little green light friend on the wall back there, we're lonely. So <laughs> it's kind of like Wilson, but it's a green light. <laughs> so. <laughs> And thanks, Bobby, for telling me he's watching on a big screen TV. Like, that doesn't give me a complex. I'm telling you, I didn't have to say that at all. You know what I mean? 
I'll tell you what you miss. I don't know if y'all miss it, but being here with just us and what I miss more than anything is the singing. I'm going to tell you. It is. That you just There's no way to. It's the best. I could just sing. I know Keith did. We could just sing the whole service, couldn't we? I missed it so much. You know, words are important, aren't they? Sometimes we say that words don't mean anything. We're often accused. Maybe you're saying something and people are saying your words don't mean anything. But words are important. Words do have meaning. Words do have conviction. Sometimes it's not just only words. It's words that can mean a great deal to us. And I think oftentimes we forget the power and importance of words that we speak and words that we hear and words that influence our lives. You know, a lot of you here at some point in your life, not all of you, but at some point in your life, a lot of you here have stood in a preacher or just of the peace or uh, wherever that might have been that you decided to uh, pledge your undevoting love to each other for the rest of your life. But, but you have uttered those words, haven't you? Some sort of a vow. And at the end of that vow, you know, I vow here this love will be my only love. We speak those words. Do those words mean something? I would hope to think they do. I know at the time we say them, they do. I know sometimes maybe uh, they don't always hold us together, I guess, in the long run, but I think they have meaning. We're vowing ourselves to each other. With this ring, I thee wed. And he says, and you say, I do, right? I do. I, I take that covenant. I, uh, I, I take that vow. I agree to, this, to the terms of this uh, relationship. Now, as we're married for 30 or 40 years, we might want to change a few of them words around a little bit, may make a few different agreements in there. But, you know, regardless, we, those words have a meaning, a deep meaning to those of us who have been married a long time. I still think about that commitment I made to my wife and about the vow that I made to her almost 38 years ago now. Obviously, that had meaning because that's held us together over our years and those, that conviction and that, that we've made to one another and that promise we've made to one another has endured in spite of a lot of heartache and a lot of trials in our lives. Uh, it's something that has meant a great deal to us. It's something that held us together. You know, I was thinking about words as I was thinking about this, and I thought, uh, what about these words? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. I'm not sure that we've ensured that necessarily in our day and time. I thought about those words. You know, those are words of conviction, weren't they? Words of power, words that men wrote and signed their name to it. They are uh, words that they wanted to, to aspire to live by. I, uh, interestingly, I hadn't done this in a while, actually in a long while. Interestingly, when I was doing this sermon, I just took time to read all the Declaration of the Independence again. I haven't done that. I don't know if you've done that in a long I think in our state of the world, the state of our nation today, you know, Google that and read it. I think we should read that. We should know what those words say because it's always we're beating it against people, but <clears throat> those words are important. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were, are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We're the only nation in the world that says that. We're the only nation in the world that in, that in their terminology or their bylaws, their creed, whatever you want to call it, we're the only nation in the world that says we have rights from our Creator. That's amazing, amazing, amazing words. With certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do those words mean something? I think they do. I think they mean something to me. I think they mean something to you. I think if you live in this country, those words have power. I think if you don't live in this country and people that want to live in this country, they, they have to memorize this, right? They have to know, they have to take a test over these words to become a citizen of this country. So those words have power, don't they? And words do have power. But of all the words in the world that have power, 
There's no other words in the world that have the power of God. I promise you. No other words. You know, at the very beginning of the Bible in creation gives you the power of the words of God. God said, let there be light. You know, that's powerful words. That's words with power beyond our imagination. Power beyond our comprehension. Words, the Bible says that He spoke into existence. To speak it into existence. Those are words, that's a word that we can't comprehend that power. And John says, the beginning of the Gospel of John, he says, <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The idea of the power of the Word of God to, to create, the power of the Word of God to to make something from nothing, and the power of the Word of God within the heart, and within the lives of a Christian. That word means something, and that word has power. And it's not just only words on a page. It's words that speak to us and guide us and move us in the way that God would have us to go. And if we don't put those words within our life and put those words within our heart, we're simply not going to know how to be the people that God wants us to be. There's no little golden corral guy with a skillet. Man, I love that commercial. There's no little golden corral guy with a skillet that thonks you on top of the head and says, listen, this is what God wants you to do, right? I've never been infused with God's Word by putting a Bible and sleeping on it under my pillow or by taking the pages and maybe eating them. I can't do that. You know, God doesn't miraculously give me what He wants me to know. Everything I know about God, I know because of the Word of God. Every, everything I understand about God, I understand because of the Word of God. How important is that in our lives, that we put that in our lives? How important is it that we know it, that we study it, that we understand it, because to know it is to know God. The true nature of God is revealed in that Word, in the power of that Word. In the beginning was the Word. Man, that's such... You know, John, I think John 14, of course, y'all know me, you know, that is my absolute favorite chapter of the entire Bible, but, but the very concept of John 14 is just to read it, it just gives you, it just gives you chills, really, the beginning of that text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Man, that's amazing words. Unbelievable words. In the beginning was a word. In the Greek, that's logos. In the beginning was logos. And it was with God, and it was God. And all things came into being through Him. It's an amazing thought of the Word of God and the power that it has within, the, within man. The Word became flesh, John says. The Word became flesh. The Word was revealed. The Word, uh oh, the Word became something that was living, something that we could see, something we could touch, something they could feel. The Word became embodied in Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ existed before He ever existed in the form of human, before He ever existed in that. And that's what John is saying. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning of time, in the beginning, before the beginning, Jesus existed with God. And He was involved in all that creation. But when God became human, when God became flesh, that Word was manifested before us. You know, we was able to see that Word and touch it and listen to it. And God was able to speak to us by Jesus Christ directly. And that Word became the embodiment of Christ. And Jesus would tell him, Jesus said, have you not been with me so long and yet you don't know God? Don't You don't know the Father? Don't you know the words I speak? I speak because of the Father. And the things I do, I do because of the Father. And I'm the embodiment of that. And so when we take the words of Jesus Christ, that's God speaking to us. That's an embodiment of that Word. And the Word became flesh. That's what John says. The Word became flesh. The Word always existed. Jesus always existed with God. But He became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And the Hebrew writer says, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, it says God, uh-oh. It says God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers, you know, He spoke, God's Word is ancient, isn't it? I just love it. I love going in the Old Testament and reading those words and thinking those words are thousands of years old. Thousands of years. You know, this country's only been a country for what, 200 and something years now, you know, 200 and whatever? God's Word is thousands of years old. That's amazing to me. You know, there's a psalm often used in funerals, and uh, it's the 90th psalm. And the reason I do is because it's a prayer of Moses. And when I think about that, I thought, it just like takes you back. It's just like you've got this ancient sacred text within your hands, and that's what you have. I mean, you have that. You have an ancient sacred text. And when I look at the 90th Psalm, and it says, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Man, that's just... That's just unbelievable, isn't it? That I can read Moses' words. Moses. Moses who crossed the Red Sea. Moses who led him in the wilderness. God, I can take his, I can read his words. And you know the beautiful thing about it, and, and, and the reason I use this text in funerals is because what's so beautiful about this text, about Moses' prayer, is that it lets you know that God hasn't changed. You know, thousands of years ago, Moses writes a prayer. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth to, to the, in the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as they watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood, and they fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass, which sprouts anew, and in the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Towards evening it fades and withers away. And as I look at that thousands of year old text, before Jesus ever was born, before Jesus ever walked the earth, or was ever crucified, or was ever laid in the tomb, and Moses says that we go back to dust, and that and that. Time doesn't mean anything to God, but Moses also says, he says in the morning they're like grass which sprouts anew, in the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Even he knew that this wasn't the end, and that gives me so much encouragement And so, because I read these words that are thousands of years old, and I know Moses was thinking about the same thing Rex is thinking about. Right? Thousands of years ago, he was thinking about being, he was thinking about what happens next and about a life after this and that that life was going to flourish and sprout anew and that there was going to be a morning. And, and that amazes me. You know, I think we take this so for granted, this word, this Bible that we hold in our hands, we take it so for granted and we take little pieces and snippets out of it and we put it on shirts, we put it on walls, and that's okay. Let's remind ourselves of who we are and what God is. And, that, and I do the same thing. I've got those things on my walls of my house. I do that same thing. But when we do that, we sometimes forget the magnitude of what we hold within our hands. The word... According to Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. You know, God spoke in a lot of ways, didn't he? A donkey talked, right? He spoke out of a burning bush. Am I right? God spoke in a lot of really, really odd ways to people, to man, didn't he? But listen to what the Hebrew writer says. In these last days, he spoke unto us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, to whom also he made the world. And that goes right back to that word being in the beginning. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. You want to see God? Look at Christ. Isn't that what Jesus says? You want to see God? Look at me. 
Look at me. Look at who I am. And when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his Son. Spoken to us, past tense. What we have is what we have. God's given us everything. The Scripture says he's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. There's nothing else we need that's not in this Word. There's nothing else we need that's not right here. God's given it to us. He's spoken it. It's all we need. He's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness right here. Everything we need. You know, I've been a mechanic for <clears throat> ever. Since I was in diapers, I think. Anyway, uh, I'm sure I was fixing a tricycle or something when I was like six months old. But uh, you laugh, but it's really true. When I was like 10 years old, my dad threw a party at his house one time, and they was all pretty well, pretty well, you know, having a good time. And they weren't thinking about a lot about what they were saying. My dad had this, this Honda motorcycle, 55 Honda scooter. And I was pretty bored because you can't drink when you're 10 years old. And uh, I said, Dad, care if I take your motorcycle apart? No, nope, go ahead. That thing never got put back together. But I did disassemble it. It stayed in a box in that garage for years. <laughs> so, <laughs> But anyway, back to the lesson. But anyway, I've been a mechanic for most of my life. And I see, I read, I've read all, and I get, there's these manuals, you know, where we do it online now. You know, we click and point like everybody does. But, we're growing, but not, you know, we have these manuals, big engine manuals, and they got all kinds of things about this engine, right? About everything about it. Well, you know, most of that I don't want to know. So there's like two pages in there I want. Like I might want to know specifically this or specifically this. And all because I know all the rest of that, and that's all I look at. And so many times in the Bible, that's how we do it. We get a problem in our life, or something happens, or maybe there's a controversy, and we want to find that page. Page 396. This is what I want. Right? And that's how we use the Bible. We use it like this thing to defend our point, or to make a point, or to, or to try to justify something that we do. And the world uses Scripture that way, and they use it wrong that way. And the Bible was never intended to be that. It was never intended to be that manual that, look at page 350 to see what's supposed to happen if you're, if you're having uh, pain in your life. You know, and that's how we do it, and we get these little cards. If you're in grief, look at this Scripture, this Scripture, this Scripture. You know, it's always good to have that Scripture, and I have Scriptures memorized that comfort me that I go to when I need to see things like the 139th Psalm. What a tremendous passage when you're in, when you're in turmoil. But the truth is, God wanted us to read the whole manual. He wanted us to know the whole thing. He wanted us to know everything about that engine, everything about God, everything. He wants us to read the whole manual. And when we read the whole manual, then when we need that piece of Scripture, we go to it and it's there and we know what it means and we know how it comforts us and we know what it means to us. But so many times we don't look at the Bible that way. We Google the passage we need. I need a passage on whatever. Google that. Oh, this is where you need to go. But do we understand it? Do we know the context of it? Have we read the whole manual? Have you read the whole manual? Because God's in every page of this manual right here. He's in every page of this book. And He gave it to us for a reason. Inspired it to us for a reason. Spoke to us for a reason. So that we would have it within our lives to do those things that we need to do. It is written. You know, there's probably not a more powerful statement in the world than that statement. It is written. You know, if we lived our whole lives by those three words, we would do all right. If we lived our whole lives by the Word of God and said, it is written, that's why I do it, it is written. You know, it's interesting when God, when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, and we love that story, right? Jesus fasts 40 days, Satan comes to tempt him. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. Have I said that? He hadn't eaten in 40 days. You've got to really remember that part to get to the next part. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. And so Satan comes to him and he says, Command these stones become bread. Well, that seems pretty reasonable to me, <laughs> right? I mean, let's face it. Jesus fed the 5,000. Jesus fed the 4,000. Right? Jesus fed all these people. And that's what Satan says. 
And, but Jesus knows that it's Satan. He knows it's a trick. He knows that he shouldn't do it. And Jesus says to him, what? He says, it is written. You know, that's probably the most profound thing on earth. You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm God's son. Get away from me, Satan. You got no power over me. You got no authority over me. Just take it. Take a hike. Pack it up. Doesn't say that. Jesus didn't say, let me call 10,000 angels, Satan. We're going to throw the whoop on you right here, right now. You're going to know who's boss. I'm fixing to show you. Let me rain down the Holy Spirit upon you, Satan. I'm going to show you the power of God. Jesus didn't do any of those miraculous things. Jesus did what we should do. Jesus says, it is written. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Isn't that amazing? Jesus didn't do any of those powerful, miraculous things, did he? He didn't say an enchantment, or he didn't throw a curse upon him, or he didn't do any of those things like we might think. He just said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so he took him up, and he put him on this pinnacle. And he said, cast yourself down. And then Satan used God's word against Jesus. Satan says, for it is written, thou shalt not bruise thy heel. And Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know, the truth is, is that Jesus knew those things. Jesus didn't have to, when Satan came to him, Jesus didn't have to say, let me find a scroll and find that passage in Deuteronomy. Hold on, give me a minute. I know it's in here somewhere. Hand me a concordance, right? Google it. I know it's here, right? Jesus didn't have to do that. Jesus says it is written. Man does not live by bread alone. You know, people always laugh at me today. I think people laugh at me. I don't know. People laugh at me for a lot of things, so it's hard to discern which one they're laughing at me about sometimes. But the truth is, is that I say we need to memorize God's Word. And people say, why? Right? I mean, we got all this technology. I got God's Word in my pocket. Right? I can Google that right now. Satan, show up. I'll Google it, you know? I'll figure it out, what's, what I need to know. No! We should have stuff within our mind, God's Word within our heart. It should be part of it. It should be ingrained within us, memorized. That we should be able to have that to rely upon in times that we need the strength of God within our lives. Where can I flee from your presence, says in the 139th Psalm. What a great passage, right? Where can I go from your Spirit? If I go to the depths... You're there. Those words should be within our heart. I shouldn't have to look that up to know it. They should be things I know. You know what I miss more than anything today in the church? What I really miss is I miss people just saying those words of God in these conversations and saying, you know, I read this or I read that. And I think we're just getting away from God's Word within our lives. And when we do that, how can we be who God wants us to be if we don't read the manual? There's so much there for us. It is written. This word that we have, we take it so for granted. People literally died. Died. So that we could hold this book within our hands throughout history. It's been burned. It's been banned. People have burned at the stake holding a Bible to their chest. This book is bathed in blood of the martyrs and the saints and of Jesus Christ Himself. It's sacred. It's holy. It's complete. And we don't know it. Man. There's nothing more powerful than this. This changes the hearts of men. It changes them. Nothing else in the world that can do that but this. That's how powerful that word is. 
It is written. That should mean something to us. When it's written in God's Word, it should mean something to you and I as Christians. In Matthew 16, He said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. How powerful are words. How powerful are the words that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. How powerful is that? When Peter makes that confession, and Jesus says, and you are Peter, and upon this rock, not upon Peter, but upon the confession that Peter made, that you are the Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father is who in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, depending on your translation, shall not prevail against it. You see how it works in my mind? How Scripture works in my mind right there? That's a good example of it. You know, I do NA, I do New American Standard. That's what's behind you. But a lot of the Scripture that's memorized in my mind is King James. You know? So when I'm up here telling you something, and it's like, and if you say, well, that ain't what that says. Well, yeah, but if you open King James, that's what it's going to say. Will not prevail against it. That's what it says in the King James. It says not overpowered in the New American Standard. But that's because those words are in my head. I can't take King James out of my brain because I grew up with it. So a lot of times when I'm quoting things, that's what comes out of my mouth because that's just how it is. But that word is powerful and effective and true. And how powerful is that word? How powerful is that confession? That you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Do words have power? Absolutely they have power. Do words have meaning? Absolutely. Words spoke with conviction <clears throat> can change can change the world. In Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. How can a word be living? Well, people tell me all the time, You've probably told me. You said, you know, I've read that passage a hundred times and it never said that to me before. How can the Word of God be living? Because it lives within the hearts of Christians. It lives in us. It lives in what we do and who we are and how we act. It manifests itself within our lives. It lives because we bring it to life. It lives within us, and it's active within us, and it's sharp within us, and it convicts us when we're wrong, and it encourages us when we're right, because it becomes what leads us and what guides us through this life. Brethren, when we don't open this book, when we don't use it and put it and nurture it and think about it, we're denying the power that God gave us to change our lives. How do I know how Rex is supposed to be? Because God wrote it down. <laughs> right? Because it's written. Right here, it is written. How do I know how Rex is supposed to love? Because God wrote it down. That I'm supposed to love you more than I love myself. That's how I know that. I didn't have that revelation. God revealed it to me in His Word. How do I know that God loves me? Because He wrote it down. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, right? How do I know that? Because God wrote it down. And if I don't know it, it's because I didn't Read it. It's powerful in my life, and I hope that it's powerful within your life. It's powerful in times of joy, and it's powerful in times of grief. It's took me through some of the darkest valleys of my entire existence. God's Word has led me through it. Sitting with my sister when she was dying and reading the 139th Psalm is one of the most powerful memories that I have in my life. 
That 139th Psalm, it got us through. It got my sister through her final days and her final hours and her final minutes because she had that whole psalm memorized. Because that's how powerful God's Word is. It comforts us in times that we need it. It comes to us in times that we desire it. But it can't do that if we don't know it. It can't do that if we don't put it within there. First Thessalonians 2, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the Word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the Word of men, but for what it really is. For what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believes, because it's active and it's living, and it performs its work in you who believe. God's Word. It's not the Word of men. And yet so many times when we're in trouble in our life, we go to somebody, we go to another Christian, and we're like, I'm having this problem, I'm having this difficulty, what do I need to do? And we say, well, I think, well, this is what I would do. Why don't we say, well, what does God say about that? What does the Word say about that? You know, this is the only thing we have. This is the only weapon we have against Satan. Do you know that? It's all we have. It's all we got is this. This is the sword. We read about the panoply of God in the Bible, and it talks about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and all those things, and all those are defensive. And it says in the sword, which is the Word of God. This is the only thing I got to strike Satan down with is this. Nothing else. God didn't say, oh, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to strike him down with. I'm giving you whatever. I'm giving you an angel to strike him down with. God said, I'm giving you this word to strike him down with. This is it. This is my power. This is my sword. This is what I had. This is what I should strap on every day. No soldier would ever go into battle and leave his sword at his house. I promise you. He might leave that shield. He might leave that breastplate. But I promise you one thing. He's grabbing that sword when he walks out that door. And brethren, when we walk out that door to face the world and to meet Satan every day of our lives, the one thing we better strap on is the sword. We better strap on our word because that's the one thing that's going to get us through that day in a way that God wants us to get through it. And I promise you, when I fail in my life, when I, and I do, I do a lot. And when I fail in my day and I fail in my life and I fail making the decisions that I should make, I promise you it's never God's fault. It's because I wasn't listening to my heart, to my spirit, to what God was telling me by his word that's inside of me that I should be and I should do and how I should act. It's when I depart from that is when I have problems in my life. As long as I stay with that, I'm okay. But when I leave that sword, all of a sudden I've got problems. All of a sudden the real Rex comes out. And sometimes the real Rex isn't who I want the world to... Well, the real Rex isn't pretty sometimes. So, i got to have that. In Acts 4, 11, 14, Household of Cornelius, right? And Peter... It actually happens in Acts 10. Peter recounts it in Acts 11, telling it to the Jews what happened. And I think this is this where I wanted to end. Because I thought of all the things that God's Word does and all the power that God's Word has in our lives, the one thing that it has the ability to do more than any other thing is it has the power to save us. You know, it's interesting in the household of Cornelius. The Holy Spirit came on them. They were speaking in tongues. Why, how can you forbid water to those who received the Spirit in the same way that we did? I mean, they've got the Holy Spirit. They've got all this stuff going on. They're speaking in tongues. All these things are happening. And yet the interesting thing is, is that when it comes to it in Acts eleven fourteen, and Peter's recounting it, what Cornelius is saying to him. And Cornelius said to call for me, and he will speak words to you by which you will be saved. Words to you. 
How powerful is the Word of God? What saves you? Your obedience to faith in Jesus Christ. How do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you have faith, and your faith is not from hearing the Word of God, then you don't have faith in God. Do I need to say that again? Right? If your faith in God is not based on the Word of God, you don't have faith in God. You have faith in something else. You have faith in what man has told you, or faith in a creed, or faith in man, or faith in a theology, or faith in a religion, or faith in something, but you don't have faith in God. Because the only way you can have faith in God is to know the Word of God. There's no other way. If you have faith in what I tell you, you have faith in Rex. You don't have faith in God. If you have faith in what a religion tells you, you have faith in religion. You don't have faith in God. If you have faith in what a wise person tells you, you have faith in philosophy. You don't have a faith in God. The only way for you to have faith in God is to have faith in the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Not by any other thing. So when we're, we have faith in God and faith through the Word of God, we have faith in God. And that faith, those words, is what leads us to salvation, what leads us to faith, what leads us to an obedient faith, is those words. People have a chance to convert somebody. Somebody asks you a question about Jesus or about the Bible. What do I need to do to be saved? Do we know the answer to that question? If somebody comes up to you and says, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to be a Christian? Well, I heard the preacher say. Right? Well, this is how my dad did it. Well, this is what I've always seen. Well, it would make sense to me. Are you able to open up your Bible and say, let's see what God has to say? you need to do to be saved. You see why it's important? The Scriptures commands us. It says, study to show thyself approved. A workman that is not ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Brethren, you and I have an obligation as Christians to put the word of God within our lives and let the power of it Take us to where we need to be. The Word of God should be so ingrained within the life and the heart and the soul of a Christian that when something happens in my life, my mind automatically goes to God's Word. It should go there. Because in that is my strength. In that is my hope. In that I find the truth of God, of Christ, and of what He's done for me. Within this is the words of salvation. The words that lead us to an obedient faith. The words that tell us to repent and be baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, right? The words that tell us that when we're baptized into Christ, we clothe ourselves with Christ. Galatians 3.26 the words that tell us that all people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And the words that tell us that we're all worthy of death and that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. Somebody asked you how to be saved, Christians in this room. Can you take them to the place they need to be? Or can you take them to one of us and say, show them where they need to be? Write those Scriptures down in the front of your Bible. Write them down. Put them on your mirror when you're showering in the morning or brushing your teeth. Put them on the dashboard of your car. Don't only read them when you're at stoplights. Put them on the dashboard of your car. Right? Put them in front of your face. Memorize them. Put them there so that you know 
and that they're always there. You know, God told him in the Old Testament, He says, put the Word of God, He says, write, He says, write it on your doorposts and on your gates and, on the, and, on, and bind it to your arms and His frontlets on your forehead. God says, put the Word of God in front of you all the time so that you will know what it is and it will guide your lives into everlasting truth. It will guide your lives into the way of salvation. Brethren, in our world of technology, in our world of everything on our fingertips, I'm just encouraging you, I'm, I'm admonishing you to place the Word of God within you. Put it within your heart. Put it within your soul. Put it within your spirit. And let it change your life. Because they're the words that lead to eternity. And we should never ever forget that in our lives. If we can help you in any way this morning, if you need the prayers of this congregation, if we can assist you in any way, if you're watching us online, if you'll send us a message, whatever you need to do, we'd be glad to assist you in any way that we can as we stand and sing. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear Lord, your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, it needs restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Do we have any other announcements that we need to bring forward? Okay. Let's do soon and very soon, and we'll be closed in prayer. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. And hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. And hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Will you bow with me, please? Father in heaven, we're thankful this morning that you give us the opportunity and the ability to come here this morning, assemble ourselves together with our brothers and sisters and worship unto you. Father, especially do we ask your blessing upon those this morning who are not able to be here, that you continue to bless them. You give them the desire and the ability to one time in the near future, come back and be with us. Father, we ask this morning that the things we've said, the things we've done here, be pleasing in thy sight, that we may be found pleasing unto you also. Father, we ask now as we depart that you walk with us, you strengthen us, you give us a desire and the ability to do the things that will please you and to bring us back at the next appointed time. This is our prayer in Christ's name.
Amen.